Hey, what's up, you guys? My name is Mikko Kraszowski, and welcome to episode 74 of That Remote Life Podcast, where we hear from location-independent entrepreneurs and professionals so you can learn to quit the cubicle and live life on your terms. Now, today, I have a super fun interview for you because my guest is Uwe Auger. Uh, Totally possible that I butchered that last name. I'm really sorry, Uwe, but uh, Uwe is the co-founder of co-working Bonsco and the founder of Nomad Sailing Retreat and My Start Bulgaria. I had a lot of fun talking with Uwe about why he decided to base himself from the small mountain town of Bonsko in Bulgaria and open up a co-working space there with the help of his co-founder Matthias, who by the way has also been on the podcast way back on episode 22. We also got to talk about some of Uwe's other entrepreneurial pursuits like the Nomad Sailing Retreat, a week-long adventure for digital nomads, entrepreneurs, and location-independent people who help sail a boat in some of the most beautiful parts of Europe, and Uwe's newest company, My Start Bulgaria, through which he's helping people establish businesses and a residency in Bulgaria in order to acquire some really great benefits like a low level of taxation and access to the European Union. Of course, uh, I can't have another uh, fellow fan of Bulgaria on the podcast without getting to dive in deep on all sorts of topics about why Bulgaria is such a great place for digital nomads. So there's plenty of that conversation there as well. So uh, if you saw Bulgaria in the title, don't worry, we talked plenty about Bulgaria. As always, you guys, you can find the full show notes to this interview over at thatremotelife.com forward slash episode 74. That's episode all spelled out followed by the number 74. And Uwe had some uh, some great discounts for you guys if you're interested in any of the things that we talk about. So make sure you check out those show notes. Uh, and if you enjoy this podcast, you guys, don't forget to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. It is one of the best ways to support this show. And if you enjoy watching these interviews instead of just listening to them, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for my name, Mitko Karshovsky, M-I-T-K-O. K-A-R-S-H-O-V-S-K-I over on YouTube and you'll find us. Uh, Like I've said before, hopefully the more of these videos that we make, uh, the easier it will be to find us on YouTube. But for the moment, you do have to search for my name to to find us. All right, you guys, without further ado, uh, I won't take any longer. Let's dive into this awesome conversation with Uwe Auger. Uwe, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for uh, being here. Mitko, thanks for having me. Really cool to be on your podcast. Awesome. I'm, I'm super excited to be talking to you. Like, like I said before we hit record. So you're one of the co-founders of Coworking Bonsko, which one is in Bulgaria, you know, which is somewhere where I'm from and I'm super pumped for Bulgaria. So I'm really excited to nerd out with you about that. Um, but you're also, you have a new company called My Start Bulgaria, where you help people become citizens in Bulgaria and to kind of start businesses within Bulgaria, which like I was telling you, I'm getting married soon. And this is one of the first things that, you know, we're going to get done uh, once we get married. Uh, so yeah, I'm super excited to talk with you about that as well. But you're in Bonsko right now, right? What's, um, how's it like in Bonsko at the moment? How's the weather? Yes, the weather is great. We had some wind coming down from the uh, mountain uh, the day before yesterday. So it brought a little bit cool air, which was great because it was really warm here. And this is one thing about Bulgaria I really love. You know, like Bansko is an amazing place to be. First of all, honestly, it's a magic place. And secondly, you know, the Mediterranean climate here is super awesome. Having the mountains and the Mediterranean climate is incredible, you know. Yeah, I think that's one of the funny things about being Bulgarian and then immigrating to the U.S. is that when I tell people where I'm from, they would, they would imagine Bulgaria as this like Chernobyl country. You know what I mean? Like that's just like the image. And I'm like, no, that's not at all what it's like. So what, exactly. what brought you to Bonsko uh, in the first place? Because you're Austrian. So like uh, how did you end up in Bonsko in, in the beginning? That's a great question. You know, many people actually ask me that and they say, hey, Uwe, how can you go to Bulgaria? You're, you're from Austria. The thing is, you know, the story is a little bit longer, actually. So I'm a, I'm a sailor. I'm a skipper. So I do also sailing retreats, nomad sailing retreats, actually. And um, so on one of the sailing trips, we joined to um, co-boat 
there's a guy who wanted to do uh, co-working, so to say, on a boat. And uh, so he was looking for sailors. He had to deliver a boat in order to um, refurbish it. And so he invited nomads and sailors alike in order to deliver the boat. So we went to, to the Maldives and sailed uh, uh, via the Indian Ocean to Phuket. It took us about 17 days. It was quite an adventurous trip. And on this trip, I met Matthias amongst uh, other people. And uh, so, you know, as entrepreneurs hang out, they talk about things and they talk about ideas and whatnot. And we ended up, you know, like, hey, this is so cool. And for me, this was the first time. It's about uh, six years ago or so. And that was the first time for me that I actually met digital nomads, location independent people. And it absolutely blew my mind. Before the trip, I was Googling digital nomad. And I was like, <laughs> I was reading a little bit. I was reading a little bit about it. And I'm like, ah, this is a hype. This will die out. You know, like this, this is not sustainable. What whatsoever. year was this? It's about six years ago. Okay. M maybe 14. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. around to, uh, 2014. Okay. And um, yeah, then getting to know the nomads, it blew completely my mind. It, it's, uh, I found it very incredible, you know, like having a job, running a business online, then traveling. And this amazed me uh, immediately. So I, I tried to find ways, you know, how to apply that knowledge to my own job in order to make myself location independent. And, and what were you doing at the time? Like, what was your, your occupation? I'm, um, I'm a real estate manager. So um, I rent out uh, um, apartments in Austria. But, you know, I always thought I need to be there, but it's not true. And mm -hmm. for most of the people, this is also true. If you run a business, um, it is also very likely if you can apply those um, uh, knowledge to, to your business that you might be able to run it remotely as well. And uh, I do this since uh, maybe 20 years or so, or even longer. And um, I just found somebody who takes care about the things. And now it's much easier for me, actually, to run the business remotely. I have a friend here in the U.S. who is uh, a real estate, like he sells houses. And mm -hmm. uh, since we started hanging out, he's like, man, I need to figure out how to do this, like the way that you do it. He's starting. He's making progress towards it. He's like has this goal of being like a remote location independent, like real estate agent. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's weird because it's one of the most like sedentary, like things that you wouldn't think you can do remotely, but you really can. So, um, yeah, but it's great. So for people that don't know, Matthias, the person that you mentioned that you met on that trip is your, the, the person you co-founded co-working bonds go with. That's right. That's right. And it wasn't the, you know, like we said initially we wanted to do a, a co-living space and we, we were looking for places in Austria. So, and um, you know, like as as you start doing things, you run into several problems or issues. And then in Austria, we couldn't find a place. We couldn't negotiate with the owner. It just didn't work out, you know, uh, until a friend of ours came and he said, you know, like he was living in Cousin Luck at the time in the Rose area of Bulgaria. And he said, why don't you come to Bulgaria? And Matthias and I, we were like, Bulgaria? Yeah, Bulgaria? We don't know Bulgaria, you know, like... Uh, let's give it a try let let's check it out you know then we found you know like there's the black sea there is mountains there is sofia there's ploft if there is all these amazing places and we thought you know like co-working or co-living on the beach it's done so often especially in asia so we don't want to be in that field you know like let's look at the mountainous places in bulgaria so we put the delegation together of six people we traveled to bansko and it immediately hit us, you know, like it was amazing. We, this town has a vibe, very, very cool. And it's an amazing little uh, mountain town. And it's also a ski town. It uh, happened to be one of the best ski areas in the Balkans. And so we said, okay, hey, let's, let's do it. Let's give it a try. So what did that friend that suggested Bulgaria, what did he say that really made you like buy a ticket to go to Bulgaria? Like, what did he, how did he describe Bulgaria that, that made you consider as a place to go? That's a great question. The thing is, Matthias and I, we really wanted to do that. We really wanted to run a co-working space. And also, you know, since 
I have been on this sailing trip and since I got to know digital nomads or location independent people, I found this is my tribe. I, I meet these people and I'm like, wow, it's, you know, you might meet new people and you think, oh yeah, he or she is nice or whatnot, you know, like, but me amongst this group of people, I was like, wow, I, this hit me like, I don't know, like a bus, you know, and, and I thought I need to be amongst them. Um, so I found out, you know, they hang out in uh, Chiang Mai, they hang out in Bali, they hang out wherever the nomad hotspots are. So I started traveling, you know, in order to surround myself with these people because I strongly believe if you are amongst people who have achieved or who can show you a way of things you want to do, it, this is the easy way, the easiest way to manifest things in your life, you know? And, but I tell you something, Mitko, this traveling, you know, like it's, I like to travel, don't get me wrong, but traveling all, all, I need to have a coffee maker and I need to have my space and stuff. I'm a little bit a complicated person in that matters. I, I, my things will never fit in one backpack for sure. You know, like that, that's not me. So and I thought, you know, like I want to have these people around me, but, but how can I do that without the travel part that I have to travel? And I thought it's actually a great idea to establish a co-living space or a co-working space where I can invite these people. They come to me. I don't have to follow them. And uh, so that, that urge actually within me was, was very big. Mm. And, and then Matthias, Matthias is a, is an amazing guy. He's also an amazing entrepreneur. And, and I thought, you know, like doing something with, together with him, you know, that's amazing. I can learn something. He can learn something. And, you know, like we have a safe, we have a, a similar vision or the same vision. So let's do this. And since we tried a couple of times in Austria and it hasn't worked out, we just said, you know, like we keep this focus. We want to do this. And it really doesn't matter where. I mean, we have been location independent at that point, and we have had um, independent groups like networks, like people networks. And we thought, you know, like it doesn't matter where to do it. And when our friend Jurgen uh, came to us and said, Hey, come to Bulgaria, we were looking it up and we really gave it a chance, you know, like we saw it's amazing. It looks amazing and, and everything about it. And, you know, you have all these uh, preconceptions about something, uh, you know, like especially countries, Eastern European countries, they were like, I had no clue about, you know, and I thought, okay, let's give it a try. And coming here really, you know, like I was amazed. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, Eastern Europe, I always tell my friends that are American, it's not the Europe that you know, but it's the Europe that will kind of like scratch an itch that the other Europe can't, right? Like I, I, when, I was in, when I was in high school and college, I would tell them, listen, you want to go to Europe, you want to take some pretty pictures, go to Western Europe, go to Paris, go to these places, beautiful. You want to go somewhere and spend a few weeks and then come back and say, I'm not really sure what happened, but I really want to go back. Eastern Europe is a place for you. You know, it has that uh, adventure sense that has drawn people to Southeast Asia for decades, you know? And I think that that's why, like, like you, I believe that Eastern Europe, uh, Bulgaria specifically, has a lot to offer digital nomads for many reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many of them are the reasons why you do what you do now. So, um, yeah, so M Matthias was on the podcast a while back. Uh, he was episode 22. So he was a while back. So we got to hear a little, a little bit about co-working bond school, but I want to hear a little bit more about, because uh, to be totally honest, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a bit selfish here. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my dreams is to open up a co-working space. So uh -huh. what were kind of the steps? What were some of the hurdles and what was the adventure of starting a co-working space in Bulgaria? Like, you, you know, the thing is uh, a co-working space, when you think about it on the, on a, on an empty sheet of paper, you know, what is co-working, you know, and you think about it. And then the first thing that comes to mind is a table, a chair and Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. And this was our opinion too, you know, Matthias and I, when we opened the co-working space, we thought, you know, how complicated can it be? You know, a chair, a table and Wi-Fi, right? And we found out it's much more complicated than that, actually. And um, establishing a co-working space, we found it really, really easy because um, we entered the realm 
like on a with an empty mind you know we we were not preoccupied so to say and i think this gave us a chance to really think about the details in order to create something that our tribe needs to to have solved you know like the, we know the problem since we travel ourselves so we know the problems and and therefore we knew what we need to offer in order that the people would like it you know it's like if you come to co-working bansko for instance it's so funny when you sit inside and the new people come in you know like their smile go around their face basically and it's like this instant family feel it's not we we don't have a co-working space some co-working spaces you see in these glossy magazines they look really nice mm -hmm. co-working bansko is not like that <laughs> you go inside it's not something you will find in a glossy magazine probably ever but it has this family feel and also one of the things we were really what was really important to us was to have a proper working space so like proper office chairs we designed our tables ourselves we, we we had a carpenter making the tables which we designed because we know you know like we don't like cables so we had a channel for the cables in the middle of the table um, we measured the space we need to comfortably work and, and so on and so forth in order to make it really a nice working area but then also having this you know like bansko wasn't on the map when we arrived here four years ago. So we had to put Bansko on the map in order that people actually, you know, consider coming here, and, which is really funny now, you know, people, they talk about Bansko, they have no clue about Bulgaria. They don't know so where, where Bulgaria is. I have to tell you, when I heard that somebody was opening up a co-working space in Bansko, I was like, what are these guys smoking? Because I know where Bansko is. I, I've been to Bansko before it was, you know, and I was like, uh okay like let, let let me know how much money you waste but then i started hearing about it and people were coming up to me they're like hey have you heard of this bonsco place i'm like i've heard of it how why why have you heard of it you know, so yeah i definitely yeah. understand what you mean by you know it might have been a little bit crazy and you guys needed to like almost mm -hmm. like plant bonsco as a place mm -hmm. yeah and you know like it, what you said is absolutely true. We went to all these big co-working spaces in Sofia at that time. I think it was about not eight or nine co-working spaces. I think mm -hmm. there is now 17 co-working spaces in Sofia. And we went all to these co-working spaces. We introduced ourselves and we said, hey, let's, we want to establish a co-working space in Bansko. And they were all giving us the looks and they were all, you know, like, I mean, they didn't pronounce it out loud, but, you know, we knew that they think we are crazy. You know? And in a way, it was crazy, uh, but I think we hit the thing, you know, like, I mean, there are so many people now, they are not happy in the cities. And here, and as we had this crazy situation coming up in March, Bansko was the best place to hang out, you know, honestly. We have, I have, um, like, two minutes from here starts the forest, right? So I walk two minutes and I'm in the forest. So I could walk every day, you know, I was outside, I had nature, I was surrounded by nature. So it's real, it's an amazing place. If you are, you know, if you consider going out from the city and going somewhere, this is a superb place to be. And, you know, like, as you are Bulgarian, you know, exactly the food in Bulgaria is amazing, you know, so especially tomatoes and potatoes, it tastes incredible. You know, it's like you go to Africa and you eat a banana, for instance, it's the same thing. It tastes totally different. And so, yeah, it's such an easy place to be. Yeah, the good thing about Bansko is that even though it's a small town in kind of quote unquote rural Bulgaria in the mountains, it is still very close to Sofia, which is the, the biggest airport. And so it's not that big of like a hassle to get from Sofia to Bansko if you knew where you're going to. And one of the things is uh, my friend, Chris Dodds, he goes by Chris, a freelancer online. When, you know, another big nerd about co-working spaces like I am. And the thing that he told me is that all the really successful co-working spaces have one thing in common, a really passionate founder who's really excited about the space and the city that they're in. And I think that's exactly what you and, and, and Matthias had was that you guys loved the digital nomad space and you loved Bomsco and you didn't, you weren't afraid 
to shout from the rooftops about it because you knew what you had. And that's, and that's, and being, having, you know, visited co-working Bonsco, I, I pulled up and you guys had like 30 people there. There was like a party. Everybody like was like super happy and like really loved there. So you guys have created a really amazing community that I would have, if you had told me that there was going to be like a thriving digital nomad scene in Bonsco, like I said, I would have been like, no, you're fucking insane. So I'm, I'm super excited that you guys did that. Uh, and, and yeah, just very pumped. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about this nomad sailing retreat that you run because my dad is also a sailor and uh -huh. he, he has recently started working remotely. He's a personal trainer and I know this is going to be right up his alley. So I know that you did that trip. Is that something that you started afterwards and, and is it still something that's running today and kind of tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So sailing is one of my passions and probably my inclination towards those topics like co-working or sailing, I, I haven't seen it with my entrepreneurial view or, or glasses. So the thing is, when we started co-working Brown School, we did it because we've, we wanted to do it. It's not because we wanted to have a business and be successfully as, as business owners. But we, we, we run it or we did it because of our passion. We wanted to create something we like and then invite other people and they might like it as well, right? And, and so the same is with, with the sailing retreat. I think nowadays, and as you are an entrepreneur as well, you know, you open the laptop and it's far too easy to stick to the laptop and, and get your head down and you can't even breathe anymore. And, you know, on Saturday you have an idea. What you do is to open the laptop and start all over again. And I think what we need is we need to have time and space to let go of things. And sailing is such a great uh, environment to do that. You're surrounded by water. Most of the times, maybe you don't even have the reception, you know, to, to do anything. And so it's a great time for, you know, getting offline time and, and really relax and give in to the emptiness, you know, like just, um, you know, steer at the water and, and you know, gaze and, and hang out and, and let everything go. And so since I, I sail about 12 years, I started sailing about 12 years ago. And I really loved it. Uh, it kind of, you know, like it was the thing. Everybody told me, hey, Uwe, you should try sailing. And I thought, nah, may, maybe, I don't know. But then I, I did one of these sailing trips and I fell in love with it immediately. And, and I knew I wanted to, to do this, like, how can I say, to dig in really deep, you know. Mm -hmm. So I started to do my sailing certificates. In, I, I've done the, all of them in Germany or most of them in Germany. And uh, so I really dedicated one and a half years of my life to sailing itself, you know, like going on different boats, having different captains and learn as you go. And so, but then I found out, you know, often a boat is a very small island, you know, so it brings people close together, which is an amazing place. Um, but then, you know, like as you, as I did a lot of sailing trips, I got to know captains. I maybe like to spend time with but maybe not you know and mm -hmm. so i thought i want to do it myself so i can choose who comes with me you know so that that was the idea but still my passion i i don't run it as a business like uh, and i i try to do it twice a year once at least you know uh to not lose track and just to go out and and do new stuff and yeah do it together with a group i when i do sailing trips what I do is like I, I build a sailing team within one week. So I, I try to, to tell people what to do and I teach them sailing and navigation and all the things needed. And uh, it's apparently very common that after going sailing with me, the people go and do a sailing certificate afterwards. So they, they really like it. They get yeah hooked, so to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm super interested in that. One of my goals actually for this summer, but obviously I wasn't able to do it this summer. So next summer is to, I'm from, you know, in Bulgaria, my home base is in Varna. And so there's mm -hmm. a very good sailing school in Varna. And so I want to go there in like one summer. It's my goal to like get my certificates and get like all those things clear. Cause I grew up sailing as well. Um, but I don't have like the skills to like 
jump on a boat just by myself. I wouldn't feel comfortable just by myself. Um, so that's definitely my goal on point. So if anyone's interested and is listening, so quick question, when you're on the sailing trips, are you able to work? How does that, how does that exactly work? Like, do you come into port and they're able to hook Wi-Fi? Like, how does that work if you're a digital nomad? So we make the rules ourselves, right? I, I always say the, uh, the boat comes empty. If you want to have a good atmosphere, then bring good atmosphere. So the boat comes empty and there is no rules. If somebody wants to work, we can do that. But I would say, and this is why I called it retreat, right? Mm. So it's, this is the time, this is the best time to disconnect. So if there is something coming up and if you don't have the chance to really let go, so we will make it happen for you to, to work. But a boat is not the perfect place to work, you know, like really in general. Um, but usually we are, what I like is uh, island hopping. So I would sail to an island and then we would anchor in a, in a most likely empty bay or where there are only few boats and, you know, hang out there, do SUP, you know, the stand up paddling mm -hmm. or go swimming or whatnot. And sometimes we would go ashore if for whatever reason, going to visit a, a restaurant or, or get to know the island and whatsoever. And um, so there is possibility that you can work. But usually what I do is I ask the people, you know, hey, do you want to give me your cell phone for this week? You know, like, so to really, you know, yeah. wind down, you know. That's the and is this something that you do in the Mediterranean or do you do it in different places every time? I sailed a lot in Croatia. Okay. I'm just personally very curious about different places. So the Mediterranean Sea is the best for sailing in terms of not sailing per se, but you can also swim, you know, the water is warm and sailing is usually relatively easy. So it's, it, the Mediterranean Sea is a great place, especially for those kind of trips I, I'd like to do. At the moment, I've seen a lot of Croatia. I've, I've sailed there um, a couple of years. And I really like it. It's really amazing. And now I focus more on Greece. And the next sailing trip is coming up in September. And I want to sail in the Cyclades uh, in the Aegean Sea. It's uh, west, southwest of uh, Athens. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so there's lots of islands, uh, lots of amazing bays. And yeah, time to hang out. So, so if anyone's interested, and this sounds awesome, what is the website that they can go to to sign up for this? Is, are there still open spots for September? Yes, there are still open spots. Um, we have about 18 people who uh, claimed interest. Uh, the website is nomadsailingretreat.com. So people can write me something or uh, get in contact or uh, even book a ticket. Perfect. Yeah, I'm uh, definitely going to be looking into that because that sounds right up my alley. I've done one really long sailing trip uh, and it was... When I was in college, I was on the sailing team and we drove down to Miami, Florida and we rented two catamarans and sailed to Bimini in the Bahamas. And it was like 12 or 14 of us, which was, I don't know who rented us boats as college kids. And then we sailed it back and it was a ton of fun. And I've always been looking forward to doing a, a trip like that uh, again sometime. Sounds so, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I came back and my dad was like the most jealous person ever. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it was great. Imagine. Yeah. So yeah. let's um to shift a little bit. I want to talk about because as you can tell, I'm really excited. I'm very pumped about Bulgaria as a space, as a country, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's this weird moment where I had this overlap happen in my life, where like you, what the moment that I heard the term digital nomad, it was a Pandora's box. Like everything else shut down, and I was like, this is the future. That, like, like I got super passionate about the space. And the more that I read about it, the more I was like, it's interesting because a lot of these digital nomad hotspots sound a lot like this other place I know really well. Right. And so I started talking to people and started promoting Varna and stuff like that in Bulgaria in general. And a lot of people that have been able to bring over love it as well. So I want to talk about your new company, my start Bulgaria and you helping people gain citizenship. Why is, why should anybody want to get a citizenship in Bulgaria? Like what are the benefits there? There is one thing which I think is a little bit unfortunate. Bulgaria is an amazing place and Bulgarians are really, really nice people. I really love them. 
Uh, although, you know, the mountaineers, you know, the people, for instance, in Banzko, they have a stiff lip, you know, they never show emotions, but this is normal. Same happens in Austria. <laughs> so you have to dig in a little bit, get to know them, and then they open up, but they are really friendly. And the thing is, you know, Bulgaria is, is mostly known for low taxation and very affordable uh, cost of living. And I think that doesn't pay a any uh, honor to what really happens here. I mean, Bulgaria is really an amazing place. You know, I really love it. It has so many benefits and, and much more than only those two. But of course, as entrepreneurs, and especially as we have been through these times in earlier this year, we know also we want to have lower costs and therefore be more sustainable. So helping people to gain residency and to come here and to live here and then also establishing a business helps them actually to lower business costs and have a really um, living in a really amazing country too. And I was, you know, you, you can do many things, sell things online or whatnot. But if you want to solve a real problem, you have to listen to people and you have to get what's actually on the ground. And running a co-working space, if you want to do it as a business and if you want to do it to earn money, it's probably not the best thing to do, to be honest. You know, running mm -hmm. a co-working space is tough, right? Um, but then, you know, I listened to all these people who came to us and they said, hey, Uwe, it's such a pain, you know, like a bureaucracy, this and that and whatnot. And I thought, you know, I, I think I built, I started, I think, six companies in Bulgaria. And I found it really easy. You know, you just need to know the process and then you go through and that's it, right? And because bureaucracy is everywhere. If you want to start a, a company in Austria or Germany or Switzerland, for that reason, it's the same thing. You have to have a process. You have to know where to go and, and, and so on and so forth. And so I thought, that's actually a great idea. So I offer a concierge service for people who, who want to get residency or who want to incorporate the business. So I do everything for them. I'm a one-stop shop. You come to me. I, I have partners. I know the process. And you get all this transparent information upfront from me. So I take you at the hand. I bring it to the bank. You open the bank account there. I take you to the accountant. You do the things with him. And, but this is all transparent. I do everything for you. You only have to deal with me. And if you travel a lot, you know, we can help you to run your business remotely. And also, you know, for every other thing you need, we are there to help the people. One of the other, you know, big benefits about doing this through Bulgaria is that Bulgaria is a European Union country. So you Absolutely. do get, you know, if you get residency in Bulgaria, you then, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are able to then spend time in the rest of Europe, correct? That's right. So for non-European citizens, it's a bit more tricky. It's not, um, uh, how can I say, you know, for European citizens, it's very easy to come here to establish your thing and to get mm -hmm. residency. For non-European citizens, it's a little bit more tricky, but there is also a process and things are clear. And once you have the residency, it's uh, very easy to travel in, in Europe. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk about Bulgaria as a place to establish residency, specifically like non-European citizens, because it is a low taxation country. I think it's what, That's like right. a 10% flat tax, right? 10% and, yeah. and you establish residency there. You have a home base that's affordable, that has a lot to offer. You know, you have... Bonsko that's in the mountains and then a four hour drive and you're in Varna, the beach, right? So it does have that's that right. sort of, I kind of call it like an Eastern European California in a way. Um, but yeah. also you get, yeah, somebody in Bulgaria needs to buy me a beer for saying that. Uh, but then you also get um, access to the EU. So I think that it is very attractive to people who need to deal with the whole like Schengen, European Union, you know, only three months in, three months, three months out kind of thing. So what's the process if somebody's listening, for example, somebody who's American, what is the process for them to gain residency in Bulgaria? For Americans, there is the trade representative. So there's an option. If you have a company outside of uh, Bulgaria, you can offer a trade representative office in Bulgaria and then apply for visa D. 
later on in that process. So it's a very straightforward process, although you have to fill a lot of forms and, and bring in documents and whatnot, and there is also background check and whatnot. But once you get that cleared uh, within two months, uh, maybe at most three, you're cleared to go and you have your residency in Bulgaria. That sounds a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I mean, there's bits and pieces, of course, and uh, you have to do a couple of things, but the process is the process, you know, and uh, once you know how it works, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And are there any, like, I know that with some countries, you need to invest a certain amount of money in the country. So I think like Portugal has like the golden visa, right, where I think it's like 1 million euro that you need to put in like a Portuguese bank account, I believe. I, I might be super off on that. Is there something like that with Bulgaria or is it just uh, establishing a company in Bulgaria? Well, there's many options. One you mentioned in the beginning is marrying a European citizen. This is also a possibility. Then, of course, most countries, even Switzerland, offers um, uh, residency for big investments. So the sum is a bit higher. I believe it's 750,000 in, in Bulgaria. I might be wrong on that. But uh, you can do big investments and then get residency. This is also possible here, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is different options. Trade res representative is one of them, and there's a couple of options. Yeah. So with the trade representative, you don't need to put up a because what I'm thinking is the the money option is a great option if you have the money. But if you're That's just right. getting started, I think that this is where people struggle. Like if you have a big business, if you're doing you know, high six, you know, low seven figures, you have a lot of options of doing this. Um, but is Bulgaria an option for people who are maybe doing a lower amount? It, does that trade representative, does it also carry a, 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 like a, a sticker price? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, the process is, is, you have to do, a, um, you have to go through the process and there is like uh, steps involved and you have to have all these things going. And therefore, the price is between two and three thousand euros. Oh. Um, so, but you know, in relatively speaking, you know, uh, for that amount in in Austria, maybe you cannot even open a company. You know, like and and here you get the visa D, right? Uh, which is which is completely amazing. You know, so it depends always on the situation, on the in individual situation as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to generalize, but uh, this is about the price you would pay. Yeah? So, okay. So you're an American citizen. You have an LLC in the U S they mm -hmm. come to you and they say, Hey, I want to establish a, a company. I want to gain residency in Bulgaria. Generally speaking, absolutely. You know, there, there could be differences, but about $3,000 get you set up with a company in Bulgaria and residency in Bulgaria that gives you any, like you can stay in Bulgaria for as long as you want to. Well, the th yes, that's a good question. So yes, it will give you the option uh, to, to get the residency, the blue residency card. Mm -hmm. um, that will need to be renewed every year. And, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, like this is the pain, so to say, you have to go through. Yeah. So the, the, this option of the residency is limited in time. It's not forever. So, yeah. And are there any like to keep the residency, do you need to spend a certain amount of time in Bulgaria? Yes, officially there are numbers like if you rent a place, then you need to be six months in Bulgaria. If you own a place, it's uh, only three months. However, you know, I think that's a very tricky question. I mean, there's things on paper, right? And there is rules and regulations. However, if I'm an Austrian and if I travel, let's say, eight months or nine months of a year, uh, the, the Austrians will t still happily accept my tax payment, right? Right. And it also depends. I mean, you know, if you spend the nine months in one other country, then it's tricky, okay? But if you travel a lot and if you go to Asia and if you can say, hey, listen, I'm not spending my time in one other country only, but I spend my time in 10 other countries and only for a month there and a month here. So then it becomes a different point of view. So there is this tax avoidance. You know, I know that especially the neighboring countries and uh, we spoke about uh, how amazing Bulgaria is, Bansko, uh, is actually in a great place because it's only two hours to Sofia and it's also only two hours to the shore of Greece. So Greece is very close 
And unfortunately, um, some people uh, wanted to avoid some taxes increase and they tried to do something in Bulgaria and that created something, uh, let's say, not so good. And so now the authorities, of course, will, will look closely on that. And in that matters, you have to find a way to do this like legally. And we only support the legal way, of course. Um, but yeah, the rules officially say six months when you rent a place and three months when you own a place. And I mean, six months sounds a bit steep, but three months I think is pretty doable if you own a place. And the good thing about Bulgaria is it doesn't take a lot of capital to purchase property, uh, especially like in Bonsko, because for people that aren't very familiar, what happened back in the day is that Bonsko is an amazing ski town. And there was a lot of people saw a lot of opportunity in it to draw tourism. And they built tons and tons of these buildings for like hotels and whatever. Then the financial crisis in 08 hit and a lot of that interest retracted. And what that's created is a lot of property uh, that's not that expensive. And like I, I've seen numbers thrown around of something like you can buy an apartment for like five or six thousand dollars, right? Like there's there's some like very affordable options. So five or six thousand, that's a steep one. You know, a studio you can get for uh, under 12,000 euros. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know Matthias bought the place for 6,000 euros. I, I know it, you know, like personally, mm -hmm. I have seen that, right? And, um, but for 6,000 euros, you know, you get what you pay for, you understand? So it's right, right. more in the basement than, you know, like it's probably a place, I don't know, but you know, if you go for a one or two bedroom place, you, you pay as little as 20, 25, maybe 30 K, you know, and it gets you a really decent place. And I think this is amazing. Try to do that in Austria or Switzerland or Germany, right. you know, that, and that is really superb. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. One of the tricky things as well with Bonsko property, and um, this is something that I've just heard. I'm not sure. So uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't want to go too low because I think what has happened is that there has been, there are so many properties there that there are buildings that apartments are being sold in that are not necessarily, there's no one else living in those buildings. And so there's some like, like of this normal regular, uh, regular like wear and tear that happens on buildings that are not lived in. So you can kind of, it's really cheap and you can buy a place for, you know, five or $6,000, but you can get in a lot of trouble if that building, no one else is living there. And there's like, you know, shit going on in there and you just own a property there. So you know, maybe don't buy the cheapest place possible and make sure that you do research, not just on the apartment, but on the building. So there's a story I have to tell you, Smitko. There's, there's an Italian guy, he visited us. It was right in the beginning, maybe half a year after we opened Coworking Bansko. And this Italian guy, he was, he was three days in, or I can't quite remember, it was either three or four days. And he said, hey, that's so cool here. And then he came back and he said, hey, I just bought the place, you know. He bought the place after three or four days. And we were like, what? Marco, what did you do? You know, like, how, how can you do that? You know? And he's still owning the place. He, he's not here. He, he comes every now and then. But however, um, you're absolutely right. And listen, never buy remotely. Don't buy anything remotely. It's so easy to try things out. I mean, come here. Be here. You can rent the place, a very decent place for 250 euros a month. I mean, how crazy is that? Come here for a month or two or three, check it out, you know, and then you find out all the pros and cons about it. And if you like it, you know, you can buy it easily. And, and find the all. area that you like, you know. Absolutely. You know, like I was living in the most Western, I, I grew up in the most Western part of Austria. So it's like Switzerland was like five minutes by car or so. And, but to go skiing, in winter, it will take me about an hour's drive to get to a decent ski area, right? Here in Bansko, I live four minutes by foot away from the, from the piste, you know? So it takes me, I just walk four minutes in winter and, and I put my skis on, you know? And this is something, it's completely amazing. It's really cool. And if you have the time, you know, if you really rent a place, if you really look into all the things beforehand, 
and then you can make a, a decision, you know, like a well-informed decision rather than um, making a guess and say, you know, I want to, to do this or that. And also the town is divided into uh, the old town, which is really beautiful with uh, Trinity Church. There's so many stories in, in Bulgaria. I've never been to a place where I could see so many stories. It's completely amazing. And, you know, like maybe you are more drawn to that place or maybe you are more drawn to the gondola, to the newer area in Bansko, where uh, it's easy and accessible to go skiing in winter. And so you have all the chances what you want to do. Also at the outskirts in Bansko, you can, you can buy a place literally next door to the forest, which is, you know, it's completely amazing. So you have all the opportunities here to really fit or suit your needs, what you want to, to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that the prices that we're throwing out would be very kind of uh, people definitely from the US would be like, wait, what? You're paying how much? But yeah. <clears throat> to give you an example, it's not just Bonsco. Sarah and I, we were walking, my fiance, Sarah and I, we were walking through Varna and, you know, they have, um, I'm sure they have in Bonsco as well, where they put up the postings, the real estate postings on like a pole yes. or whatever. And we found, in the, I think it was, a two bedroom apartment in Varna with a panoramic sea view. And I think it was 250 euros per month. And I mean, that is to sign a lease, but still like, like we're paying like uh, a little over, like, I think we're paying a thousand bucks a month for our apartment here in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it does not have a panoramic, you know, like sea view. So it, it, I, I think that that's why if you're a digital nomad, it's good to have a home base, just like you have a home base. It's nice. You know, I, I believe in this idea of going through seasons. And I think a lot of people, when they just enter the lifestyle, they just become location independent. They go straight for the travel. They spend a year, maybe two of like really being nomadic, jumping around every month or so. But then afterwards, they're like, okay, I've been to a few places. What are the places that I like? Let me establish a home base. And that's why I think Bulgaria and with the service that you offer is such a great place to do that because you're in the European Union. It's low taxes. You can buy a place relatively cheaply, even if you're not occupying it 200 bucks a month for an apartment times 12 is what like, I don't know, I can't do math that quickly, you know, but it's, it's, it's very affordable even if you're not using it. Um, and you're on the doorstep of both Europe and Asia. So, uh, you know, it's easy, it's easy traveling wherever you're going. So that's why I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's why I'm so pumped about the space like you are. You're absolutely right. And that's the thing. And I, I think people have to understand this, you know, like Sofia as a hub, as an international hub, you know, flying in and out from is very affordable. You can mm -hmm. get a deal to Chiang Mai for 350 euros or something like this. So it's, it's really an incredible place to be. And then also you have this amazing country. You have this amazing scenery. Like, okay, let me tell you uh, a perfect ski day in winter. How does that look like? Okay. So in the morning time, I would stand up. I'm the first in the line uh, at the gondola. I go up the mountain, I ski for two or three hours, I come back, I work in the co-working space, and then in the afternoon, evening time, I go to Banya, I go to the hot springs, I sit in this nice hot mineral, natural mineral water, you know, and then get my dinner there, and this is a perfect day in winter. This is how it works here, and this is something I, you know, like, I've never thought that these things are combinable you know and and here it's so easy and accessible and not only that but also affordable you know that let's see so that's what i was going to say let's let's dive in deep here a little bit because we're talking about costs we're talking about why this is affordable for people to do why they should establish residency in bulgaria why they should have a business why it should be their home base that perfect day that you just described let's run through the costs of it so that people know not only what does it cost to rent there but what does it cost for you to live that perfect life so how much is the, you named a few things there. Uh, let's go through them one by one. So what is the cost of a, I know that a big cost and a lot of other ski places is what does it cost to have like the, the lift? I believe that's a big cost, right? Is to, to get to the top. That's about 40 euros. 40 if euros. You buy a, if you buy a day ticket. Okay. So if you buy a season pass or, or like the, uh, the 20 day pass or so it's, uh, you can go far cheaper, right? 
So, but if you buy a day ticket, it's like 40 euros for a day in order to use the ski lifts and stuff. So right? do you know how much it is for like a season pass? The season pass, I believe is around uh, 12, 1300 leva or so. 1300 leva. So that's what, like $600, give yeah. or take. Yeah. Yeah. And I think compared to the rest of Europe, that's like a fraction of the cost, right? Like what would something like that cost in Austria? It's the costs of skiing are rather similar. So okay. it's like the skiing, um, the, the lift pass is not really ch cheap here as are the other things. Mm. But, and here comes the point. If I go one day skiing in Austria, it costs me 100 euros. You know, if I go skiing here, I might have the cost of 40 euros or maybe 45 euros of, this, of the ski pass, which is very similar to the Austrian ski pass. Mm. But then I go and eat at the piste and if i know the right uh, uh, restaurant to go to i pay let's say five to seven euros for for a meal and a drink which in austria is impossible <laughs> that is not right. possible you know? <laughs> and and then i go maybe if i if i if i book transport so maybe i have to pay five lever for 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 a bus five lever is about two and a half euros uh, let's say three bucks and and then I go to Banya. So the entrance there is uh, seven leva. And Banya is like a hot spring, you know, like it's uh, a hot spring. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you have dinner there and dinner might be 15 leva. So it's, you know, like it's, if, if you calculate the entire day and compare this to Austria or other places, Chamonix, France or whatnot, you know, mm -hmm. then you find this cost around the skiing is much more affordable. Mm -hmm. And, Still in winter, you know, you can shoot uh, an apartment for 300 euros a month. In winter, the, the rent is a bit higher because of the heating costs. Yeah. Uh, but it's still very affordable, you know. And also, before I forget, sorry. The, the thing is, if you own a place here, the community here is so big uh, now that it's so easy that you can rent out the place if you're not here. So you will always find somebody, an, a successor who takes, you know, like, happily uh your apartment for the next three months or so mm -hmm. and usually people come for a season like they come not for one week or two uh they usually come for three months and i think one of the i, I just wanted to to make a note on this because people hurt i you mentioned banya and you mentioned you know hot spring and, and people might be a little bit like what's going on here so bulgaria has and i believe this is true i've definitely heard it more than once but i i haven't actually double checked I believe Bulgaria has more mineral springs in the you know geographic location than Canada, the United States, and Mexico combined. Uh, and a and a and there are a lot of these hot springs. So I know that specifically Varna, for example, where I'm from, it's built on top of hot springs to the point that when I was swimming there, I was a competitive swimmer, and mm -hmm. the big city pool is actually filled with hot mineral water that they then need to actually add cold water at to cool it. And it really reduces their cost because in most other pools, you need to heat it up, right? And they are just, nope, we just dump the hot water that comes in naturally. So you do have, there are lots of places and in Bonsko specifically, there are a lot of places where you can do the hot springs and do the, those sorts of things. Um, so it's, and it's definitely much cheaper than something that you would pay in like Iceland, for example, for like the, the you know, a similar experience. So I, I think we have to fact, uh, fact check this, but I, I have heard that uh, Bulgaria is one of the top most countries with uh, the, the most mineral hot springs. It's not mm -hmm. the top most, but it's one of the uh, countries with the most hot springs. And I tell you guys, this is really amazing here. You know, like going to the hot springs, take a soak, hang out, especially when it rains or especially in winter when it snows, S sitting in the hot springs is absolutely amazing. You know? It's really, really cool. Yeah, it's something like I, I've actually never done it in Bulgaria, but um, I did it in Iceland just a few months ago, and it is amazing. Like it's snowing, it's cold, but you're in the hot spring. It's it's just so nice. Um, I do want to ask about because you did mention the community, and one of the things that when I was in Bonsko that immediately popped in as a question for me was, how are the locals reacting to this? Because Bonsko is a small town. It's not. I mean, I would struggle to call it a city. It, it is a small town. It is in the mountains. There is like a local population that I think tends to be a bit older. 
what has the local population thought of all of these digital nomads coming and descending onto their town? Yeah, of course, in the beginning, you know, like people don't know what happens. And it's been so funny. You know, Matthias, uh, he's originally from Germany. I'm from Austria. So when we came to this small town, the first thing we thought is like, if we want to open something, we need to go to the mayor and we need to tell him, you know, we go, mm -hmm. you know, like, we just present ourselves and say, listen, hey, we want to do this, you know, and this is what we did, you know. And the mayor looked at us and he said, you know, like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> he said, co-working, you know. And he's like, hmm, I don't know co-working, you know. And then he came, we had ribbon cutting. So it's like the in our opening ceremony, the, the mayor actually came and, and opened the space with us. And, and he came in his speech, he said, you know, like, these guys came to me a couple of months earlier and they told me about co-working. I don't know what it is. I still don't know what it is. But, you know, I see all these young people here and it seems to be what they do is amazing, you know. And I think this is kind of reflects the, the general image of us, you know, like they don't know what we do exactly, uh, which is on one hand, it's a bit a shame because we also wanted to attract more locals. Mm -hmm. But as you said, the, the generation here is a little bit older and it's, it's really awesome, actually. You can see, you know, the old grannies sitting outside, you know, like, uh, and, and having, you know, like, they just sit outside and it's cool. And sometimes you can see that they cook the paprika and whatnot and, and do the original stuff with firewood and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, really cool, you know, to see that. And on the other hand, you can see somebody passing by with a boosted board and, um, yeah, and then it's perfectly fine. And in the beginning, I thought, you know, like that, some people had the impression we come and take something away from them. And now this over time that has changed. So now they see that we bring actually a lot of young people and, you know, bringing knowledge in and also people spend money and time here. And since we mentioned the community, you know, like, like over 30 people have already established a permanent base in, in Bansko. So it's mm -hmm. like, from all the people coming through the co-working space, I think it's about 800 people who, who went through. It's like 30 to 40 people have now established a permanent base here, which is completely incredible because they are not only passing through, but they stay, they stay here, they like it, they love it. Mm -hmm. And now one of the newest projects I started is a makerspace. So now we are in the, in the process of establishing a makerspace here. So in order to attract more people and we want to build our furniture ourselves and start pottery or sewing and whatnot. So also we have gardening projects. So we, we do like, yeah, we like sustainable li living and all this is also part of Banskrum. No? Yeah, you know, that's like one of the other kind of benefits of being in a low cost place is that you can do a lot of things, right? Like when it's not the rent isn't just cheap for apartments, the rent is cheap for you to get a place. And, and, it, and it's almost like this sandbox where you can be very risky because the negative downsides of everything to go wrong are relatively like I mean, they can hurt, but like, it's not going to be like you're losing out on tons of money. So I, and I think it's so exciting for young people, people who are entrepreneurial, who just want to experiment and try things. Uh, it really works. But speaking of, uh, to the community, I did have this really funny experience when I was uh, at the co-working space because you're kind of in the middle of some houses and there's actually a Bulgarian grandma that I think owns the building next door. And I was sitting there in the backyard working on my computer and there were people that were doing like acro yoga in the backyard and behind them kind of like where I was looking. So right in front of me were these guys doing acro yoga. And then right behind them on the other side of the fence was this grandma that was like, you know, wearing the like normal kind of outfit and goodly, you know, going in her garden. I was like, what the hell am I seeing? Like, this is such a weird, like, they're the I'm working on my computer. There are these guys doing acro yoga, and behind them is like a Bulgarian grandma working on our garden. Like it was such a strange yet perfect description of what you guys have like done there. It was just it was just very funny to me. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's very funny. And and there was also like that night there was a party at the co-working box, and I was like, I bet that grandma's not very happy right now about the party. <laughs> but yeah, has we had some. We had some parties, you know, like, especially in the beginning, you know, like when we haven't had this much, um, you, you know, in the beginning when we started out, 
um, the place was not known, people did not know mm -hmm. about. So our community was very small. So, and at that point, we also invited the expat uh, in Bansko. We invited, let's say, the whole Bansko, you know, to join in on Friday barbecue, for instance, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And, but our community is very different than, than the expats, for instance, you know? And so we are more aware of what's going on and the people are really taking ownership. You know, they say, mm -hmm. hey, yeah, we're living here and, you know, we want to be careful about what's happening here. And in the beginning, you know, those parties when everybody was invited, they were really, you know, like parties until yeah. morning time and, and really rough. And maybe we got some calls the next days. And, and so well, on. if there's one thing, if there's one thing Bulgarians understand, it's how to party. I think every yeah. Bulgarian, you know, understands kind of, and every, a lot of Eastern European culture, I think is very much like, Hey, we work hard, but we party really hard as well. So yeah. That's you know, true. weddings will Absolutely. go all day and into the morning. My, my cousin's actually married to a German girl. And it was very funny because, mm -hmm. you know, all the Germans went to bed at like 1 a.m. or something like that. And then the Bulgarians oh. were up until like five in the morning. So, <laughs> um, cool. but yeah, so I think, you know, I definitely agree. It's I, I think this is what I've been pushing into Varna as well, because I think digital nomads and people who establish home bases in Bulgaria can bring a lot of benefit, not just money. They can also bring a lot of, you know, knowledge and can you know shine a light on opportunities that locals wouldn't normally see i mean like when when i was in bonsko i was told that there was a restaurant down the street that everyone goes to i'm sure that guy's super happy that you guys are there because he's built a relationship when we were in there another person walked in randomly with a co-working bonsko t-shirt and so you know you are adding a lot of value to the local to the local economy that wouldn't be there otherwise uh, so I think that, you know, uh, that's amazing. And I hope to see more of it in more places, not just Bonsco. But, uh, you know, in wrapping up, uh, and I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I am curious. We've talked here for almost an hour about how amazing Bulgaria is, all the really great things, all the really cool things that you're doing, um, and, you know, all the opportunities in Bulgaria. But I think we do need to shine a light on, you know, maybe what are some of the negatives because there's no such place as a perfect place. And it would seem almost ridiculous if we were just like, Nope, there's nothing negative. You know, don't, don't worry about it. What are maybe some of the negative things that people who are maybe considering coming to Bulgaria uh, need to be aware of? So that's true. Um, I would say the things, the pitfalls, so to say is like, let's say, Bansko is a very small place, so that also doesn't offer so much opportunity to, to get hold of things. So mostly we need to order stuff if you have a special dietary plan or so. So like there is online services where you can actually buy stuff, but Bansko doesn't offer so many things. Mm -hmm. So um, if you, but also on the other hand, now with uh, this, with this growing community, uh, as you mentioned, you know, like lots of businesses established there or lots of people established actually a business to, to bring in more stuff. And now, for instance, also um, a food store opened, uh, like they sell raw stuff and healthy stuff and, mm. and so on and so forth. And, but this is, this is something that's a downside, you know, like it's not a city where you can get everything around the corner. And right. we still miss some barista places so um, that is something, you know, like I like to drink good coffee and that, that's a bit something I, I'm worried about. Um, other than that, it's just the next I, business, Uwe. It's just the next thing, right? It's just a, a nice high-end coffee maybe. shop in Bansko. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yes. So what no, about but, Bulgaria in general? Because that's Bansko. You know, Bansko is a small town. You can't expect all of those uh, crazy things. Uh, in cities like Sofia and Varna, you can get deliveries. I do know that there's like a service that you can order from, I believe, the German or the British Amazon, and they will actually deliver it to your place in Varna. Uh, I do have friends that do that uh, a lot as well. But what about Bulgaria in general? Well, um, I think... One of the things, and this is a really tricky one, is the language. So mm -hmm. Bulgarian, it's so tough for me to learn it, honestly. I, it's not, also, you know, um, you, you use the different alphabet. So you the have Cyrillic. To use Cyrillic. And mm -hmm. for me, this is really something which I think is tough. That's, uh, that's a bummer. And um, 
Also, one thing I think is, uh, which also strikes me a little bit, is the traffic. There is not a lot of traffic, but the people are more, let's say in Switzerland, if you drive in the traffic, it's rather easy and relaxed. It's and chill. In Bulgaria, it's not so chill. It's a, it's a bit different. So you have to keep yeah. an eye on you drive a car here, you know, like be careful, you know. Yeah, I mean, listen, you learn to drive in Bulgaria, you're fine anywhere else. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's at least, the, that's the benefit that I put on it is like, you know, you learn to drive here and you can get by in Bulgaria. For me, that was a big test because I learned to drive in the U.S. and I really avoided driving in Bulgaria for a long time. And then now the past two or three years, I've driven in Bulgaria and I'm like, send me anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm okay. You know? So, yeah, it is. Um, I think Bulgarians are unlike Germans. Right. For example, just picking a, a, a country that's a stark opposite. Bulgarians are hot blooded, right? Like we're warm blooded. That's we're right. more like Italians, right. Greeks, you know, while I think Northern European countries are much more like analytical, like they're more relaxed or, you know, while Bulgarians are a little like, you know, like excited and like that kind of stuff. So I, I definitely know that one. Absolutely. So, yeah. And there's one thing I want to mention. I think that is very important. And this really strikes me all the time. Um, you know, like, like Austria or Central Europe, Germany, Switzerland, for that matter, we have lots of rules and regulations and everything is regulated. I'm not allowed to, mm-hmm. to light the bonfire in Austria and stuff like this, you know? Here in Bulgaria, it's, there's less regulations. There is less of these restrictions. And this is a double-edged sword in a way, you could say. And, but for me, you know, like the positive outweighed the negative by far, you know? And... The thing is, coming here and living here, I have the feeling, you know, like there's so much opportunity. There's so much possibilities. And I, I think this is due to the fewer regulations. You know, like mm-hmm. I had a boosted board. I bought one. And, and so because it's, uh, we live in the mountain, right? So it's like it's steep at times. So in order to commute, I don't want to use my car. So I thought an electrical boosted board is just the thing I need, right? And it's really incredible because you could see a horse cart, you know, next to me and I drive by with my boost support. <laughs> and so once I used it, you know, like and it, it, it went really fast. I think it went 40 kilometers an hour or something like this. I, I sold it in the meantime. But uh, when I used it and then I passed by, I, I used it on the street, of course. Right. And um, so when I passed two police guys, you know, they were looking at me and I was looking at them. And, and then I see, you know, they started smiling <laughs> and I smiled as well and I passed by, you know, and I thought, you know, like if I'd be in Switzerland, that would be a little bit different of a story. You know? <laughs> yeah. You, in, in that case, you're, you're mo- more likely for them to pull you over and ask you to try it on in Bulgaria than they would be to, you know, uh, to actually give you a ticket. So that definitely describes Bulgaria. And I, and I do think Bulgaria is almost like a very libertarian libertarian country without kind of i think libertarianism can be can get a bit negative but i do think that bulgaria has a has captured a good way of it um i mean there is the corruption that you'll see in a lot of eastern europe which can be a problem but i think that as an expat or as a digital nomad that doesn't really i just don't think that you'll be impacted by it as much um and so i do think that yeah i mean i'm with you 100 percent. i'm so glad to have gotten to talk to you about it but, but also, you know, Mitko, I, I, I used to live and work in Zimbabwe, you know, in the mm-hmm. southern region of Africa. And to be honest, I, I know how corruption can look like, you know, like mm-hmm. on a very, very different level. And I think uh, in Bulgaria, you can hear a lot about mafia and you can hear a lot about uh, corruption. But personally, me, I have never, ever, it never occurred to me that somebody came to me and asked for extra money or something like this. It never, ever happened. So, uh, yes, there is a talk about this. It never ever happened to me, you know. And also in Bansko, and I must say, this is one of the things I can I can park my car here. I don't even lock it, you know. Mm. And uh, things I have never heard that things come away. It's a small town here, and you know you can hear all sorts of stories, right? But then there is the thing: what do you experience? And and I must say, this is one of the things here I, I really appreciate, you know. Yeah, I mean, like that is a good point about. I think the corruption in Bulgaria, and I feel like if I have Bulgarian friends who listen to this, they might disagree with me. But in my experience, it feels like it's more high level. Like it's not so much anymore where you get pulled over and a cop asks you for money. It's more the corruption's happening at a higher level that unless you're like living in Bulgaria full time, the 
effects of it don't really trickle down to you as much. It's still not a good thing. It still shouldn't be happening. Um, but yeah, and I and on the safety factor, even not in Bonsko, in Varna, where Sarah and I live in in, in Bulgaria, um, you know, Sarah has many times said that she does not feel comfortable walking home at night in the U.S., but in Bulgaria, she has no problem walking back by herself from the beach to you know our apartment uh, at two in the morning, and that's I think a testament to just how safe it is. Absolutely. I see this exactly the same way. I think, you know, for, for soul travelers or women, you know, this is a really great place to, to travel. And whatever you have heard about the Balkans, you have to come here, you have to figure it out, you have to see it yourself. You know, like, it's, it's really a fantastic place. And there is so many places next door. You know, you go to North Macedonia, you go to Croatia and, you know, it's or Albania. You know, mm -hmm. I, I had some... some um, uh, thoughts about Albania, you know, like as all these rumor travels far yeah, like than preconceived else, notions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go there, and I was completely amazed. You know, like it's there's so many places close by you can visit and 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 find amazing places everywhere here. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Uwe, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, if anyone is interested in uh, both the sailing retreat, uh, co-working Bonsco, and your new company, MyStart Bulgaria, where can they find out more about those uh, if it sounds like something they want to you know, explore? Absolutely. Coworkingbansko.com is uh, for when you go for co-working, Nomad Sailing Retreat. Uh, if you want to go sailing, MyStartBulgaria.com is where you can reach me. You can book a free call, 30 minutes. I can give you hints and tips what to do and what not to do. So yeah, reach out to me. And if anyone's interested in connecting with you on social media, what's your, what's your poison of choice? <laughs> well, I, I go with Facebook and uh, this is where, yeah, like it's the easiest to connect with. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Uwe, thank you so much for coming by. I really appreciate it. And, uh, Maybe see you in a Bansko uh, next year, you know, in person. <laughs> Absolutely. Come around, you know, like summer is amazing. Usually we do jam sessions at night. We go <laughs> hot springs. We have Friday barbecues. So summer in Bansko is amazing. I guarantee Wow. You. I can't think of a better way to end this one. But thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs>